Good afternoon. Welcome back to the BNH virtual event space. Today we're going to be demystifying AI. And for that, we welcome Mark Milstein from Visual. Mark, how's it going? Just fine. Thank you very much for having me here, Derek. I, I got to be honest, I've been waiting for this workshop more than any other workshop. No shade to anybody else out there, but it's such an interesting topic. And after our conversation a few weeks back, Mark, I, I just knew I'm like, this is going to be something that's really going to dive in and not just demystify AI, but it's going to drive the conversation forward. For those of you out there who are fans of AI, this is for you. For the skeptics, it's also for you. I think that this is just going to be a super informative and really engaging conversation. That being said, I'm going to go grab my popcorn and I'm going to kick it over to you, Mark. Any and all questions are welcome for this. So feel free to get those in to everybody out there viewing us. Uh, if you haven't checked out our YouTube where we stream all of our content live and it lives, go to YouTube, BH Event Space on there. To everybody else joining us across the internet, welcome to you as well. Mark, take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mark Milstein, as I, as I was introduced, uh, and I am the co-founder, and I'm also the rainmaker at a company called Visual. Visual is a technology company that pioneers uh, the acquisition, processing, and licensing of GDPR-compliant biometric data and ethically sourced, legally clean licensed visual content for the generative AI, ML space, and beyond. And we do that via our, what we consider to be a very pioneering platform called the Data Set Shop. And the data set shop is this place where, where companies that are interested in developing AI go to acquire legally licensed visual data and beyond. Um, and I thought that today would be a very educational uh, uh, opportunity for, for everybody who has, as Derek was described, even a, even a minimal amount of interest in uh, the generative space and what's going on here. I hope to answer a lot of questions like what exactly is generative AI? Where did platforms like DALI and Midjourney get their training data. You know, what if you want to shoot real models? What is what do you need? You know, do you need special legal documentation? You know, who are the vendors that you can trust to onboard your content? But I thought let's go through an introduction uh, of the entire space first of all, and talk a little bit about what we're doing here at Visual. And I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, just give me a second. Uh, let's see here. Let me get the right button. Here we go. There we go. Let's see. Let me screen. Let me. Uh, share my screen. Um, as I said, Visual is a company that specializes in the processing and acquisition of generative of, of, of legally licensed GDPR compliant data. And what is exact what exactly does that mean? We go out and we source photography, video, audio, and text data for the provisioning of and the training of generative AI products. And you're thinking to yourself, well, what exactly does that mean? What do, what do you mean by photography and video? Well, we're looking for all kinds of video, all kinds of photography, especially for those content creatives who are involved in the visual space. That means photography of everything from asphalt to zebras, everything from, from kitchen utensils to even you know ferns and plants to backgrounds. It could be just about anything. Uh, and the world of generative AI is just literally now becoming clear to all of those and all of us, I should say, who have been uh, at the cutting edge of it for the last couple of years. We didn't quite know how this was all going to play out. We had no concept whether or not the the, the greater uh, uh, consumer world would would take would take to generative AI, what kind of form it would take. We didn't understand that. Products like DALI or Midjourney or Stability AI uh, would become popular. We didn't have any idea that ChatGPT would ultimately come out on, you know, come out and then instantaneously become so ubiquitous in our daily lives that uh, it's always it seems like it's always been there. But the most important thing is that generative AI, artificial intelligence, relies exclusively on data. Without data, none of this works. All everything, you know, all of the other aforementioned products without any data are just nothing but lines of code. Those lines of code, especially when it comes to, to visual creative content, require photography or video. And where have they been getting that stuff from? Where have they been getting their content from? Well, um, there's both good and bad news here. Um, over the past couple of years, we have been living in a sort of a, at least those who have been in the, the generative and, and, and artificial intelligence world have been living in sort of this kind of a bubble where the content was taken from the internet, 
lots of lots of research and development work was done under the guise of what I would call fair use, where in sort of a uh, educational research phase, uh, you know, PhD students, master's degree students, researchers at a variety of colleges or, or universities or even within companies would go out and they would scrape the likes of Flickr, they would scrape the likes of, 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 the, of, the, of the Internet in general. Uh, and they would take down low resolution versions of photography and video uh, under the under the idea that that content would never see the light of day outside of a outside of a uh, um, of a laboratory. Um, but uh, unfortunately for many of the products and unfortunately for many of the con the copyright holders, uh, those products under what I call in many cases a slate of hand, ended up being productized. That I consider to be the original sin and unfortunately has given generative AI a really bad name. Um, we at Visual uh, took, the, took the, the, the position that we would never ever uh, steal or scrape data uh, for our uh, uh, data set shop. Uh, we wanted to acquire data, lots of it. And so because we all come from the, from the, from the content creative side, I myself have been a photojournalist uh, for more than 30 plus years. I worked for more than a decade as a, con as a combat photographer photographing uh, uh, conflicts around the world between the, during the 1990s. Uh, I founded uh, two photo agencies on my own, uh, and so uh, the, the other founders of, 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 of Visual, Michael Osterreiter and Nicholas Mejias, both are considered to be A-listers, uh, top 10 uh, licensed uh, uh, stock photographers in the world. Uh, we all know about copyright. We all know about model releases. We all know about property releases. We all know about the legalities and everything else that goes into play here. And so we took the position that we would never, ever scrape data, but instead would go out and license our content, license all the content that we need in the same way uh, that the likes of a Getty or a Shutterstock or a, you know, an Alamy or a Pond5 would do. And so we, we, we went out and we, we contacted as many content creatives as we could. We contacted photo agencies, stock agencies, like the aforementioned ones, and we asked them whether or not we could actually then uh, work in a partnership with them in order to then take on their, uh, to take that content, uh, aggregate it, uh, put it together uh, in a way that 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 didn't uh, that that allowed for the content to be what I call valuable uh, to the likes of a uh, to companies like Google or Meta uh, or Adobe or others who are willing to to actually pay for the content, and so. Um, we, we, as I said, we, we knew very early on that besides the copyright issues, that there were going to be a heck of, of what I call a heck load of, of risks of using poor data. In other words, companies that were involved, uh, as I said, in, 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 light, in, in scraping data did so just in terms of getting lots of volume. They didn't really think about you know, the quality of the data. They didn't think about the, the amount of time and effort that it was going to take to process that data and to get that data, what I call uh, ready for showtime, ready for you know prime time, um, and 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 many of the many of the the, the 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 unfortunately glaring errors that have come to out to being in the last couple of months now that uh, uh, generative AI has really come into the public space is that much of that data, much of the data that they scrape, contained a lot of ethical risks, contained a lot of technical issues, contained a lot of legal risks. Uh, uh, it extended the training times. It, it costs a heck of a lot more. Uh, there were huge volumes of copyright issues that needed to be uh, uh, dealt with and still need to be dealt with. And so we we thought, and we we still we see that uh, the data that we were taking in via uh, uh, the aforementioned channels that we pay a royalty fee to, uh, that we acquired uh, through ethical and legal uh, uh, channels, uh, that we ensured that the content creatives were remunerated, that they were paid a royalty uh, for, actually do result in uh, much better training results, uh, that they are legally compliant, as I've mentioned quite a few times, that they, that they, that they comply with GDPR uh, and uh, BIPA and PII and CCPA rules, um, you're probably all wondering what is GDPR. GDPR is the European General Data Protection Regulation. Uh, BIPA is the Biometric Information Privacy Act. Uh, and uh, 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 CCPA uh, uh, is the, uh, what do you call it? Is the, uh, uh, the same rules and regulations uh, that are used in, in, in Canada. Uh, 
We wanted to ensure that, uh, that the data licensing uh, scheme, that the entire uh, workflow was very transparent and that everybody understood from beginning to end uh, that the content creatives were going to be paid, that there was going to be remuneration, that we weren't going to work, we weren't going to work in any sort of a uh, stealthy uh, gray area and that we were only going to deal with high quality data uh, and that the data would be ready to use. Uh, and this is the data set shop. Uh, the data set shop allows, again, for anybody between, you know, anybody who's interested in training uh, their content to come on board and source high quality data that's legal. I mentioned that 100,000 times uh, and that, that that is ethically sourced. And I'll mention that another 100,000 times because I want to absolutely ensure that everybody understands that all content creatives that we work with, uh, whether photographers, videographers, or even now in this particular week uh, uh, as a new, uh, so we have a new uh, uh, offering, which is now audio data, uh, that everybody is remunerated with 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 royalties and that they are, that they're, that they're, uh, that they receive money for their efforts. Um, this is what a typical data set looks like uh, when it involves people. Uh, models are brought into a studio. Uh, models are asked to uh, uh, to to uh, uh, to show at a base emotions. I think eleven of them. Uh, they're photographed in a three hundred and sixty five degree environment, uh, approximately two hundred and fifty to three hundred images at a time. Um, those images are shot on a green screen or a blue screen. Uh, we work with RGBA uh, uh, as well, and uh, those images are then aggregated into data sets based upon gender, ethnicity, age, emotional state, just about everything. And you're thinking to yourself, okay, so what does anybody do with all of this? Uh, are these images going to end up being used to create synthetic humans? Well, uh, that might happen, although I can tell you right now that in the past, let's say, eight months, uh, we haven't had a single uh, client approach us to take any of this content, to turn it into any kind of what I call competitive synthetic content, competitive stock content. In other words, that we haven't seen what I call a very big uh, shift or a sea, uh, sea change in that direction, uh, where we sort of imagined in the very beginning that the majority of our clients would be, you know, looking to sort of develop uh, mid-journey stability AI or DALI competitors. Uh, exact opposite has actually happened. In fact, the majority of our clients have been in the security field. Uh, they're looking to uh, determine or they're looking to create products uh, that uh, either determine whether or not a person is being truthful or not, whether or not a person who is allowed entry into a particular location is that person, whether that person is uh, has the ability legally or, or security-wise, uh, the ability to enter or not to enter uh, certain areas of, 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 of an office or, or, a, or a facility, a manufacturing facility. Uh, we get incredibly interesting, what I call rather right out of left field uh, requests uh, from companies that look to design uh, products uh, using generative AI, and they need con they need training data. We got a request not even about three weeks ago from an airport authority in Europe looking to create a algorithm that better tracks luggage. So we began scrambling and looking for it tens of thousands of pieces of luggage, uh, photographs of tens of thousands of pieces of luggage to create a data set. So as I mentioned in the very beginning, uh, data sets run the gamut, everything from asphalt to zebras, and in this particular case, uh, luggage. And if you're thinking to yourself, well, how much money can I make from shooting data sets? Because really, that's the end of the, that's really sort of the target here, is not just to educate all of you and teach you, you know, the ins and the outs of generative AI or the ins and the outs of data set creation, but to talk to you a little bit also about how much money you can possibly make by shooting data sets. Because look, as much as many of you fear the arrival of generative AI, I will also tell you that there is a huge amount of uh, opportunity here. And as I mentioned very in the very beginning, generative AI will not exist without great quality data. Everything else, uh, without great quality data, all it is is just lines of code. But with great quality data, uh, there is going to be uh, an explosion of products which are based upon uh, good quality training data. And that training data has got to be real photography, real video, real media content. Uh, when it comes to shooting real people, biometric data, uh, shooting people in a studio, shooting people in all kinds of environments, the amounts of money uh, that can be earned by content creatives, by photographers, videographers is staggering. 
uh, a data set uh, in shot in 4K could earn six hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars uh, 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 for 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 uh, for the for the complete set of 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 of, con of images. Uh, and of course, the the content creative would get a percentage of that. I think we're currently paying right now a royalty of fifty percent. So that means uh, the content creative would walk away with three hundred twenty five thousand dollars if it was a full. 4K license data set. Uh, that is not a small amount of money to sneeze at. It's not nor is nor something that I perhaps even myself would ever say no to if somebody should ever approach me and ask me to shoot that kind of content. Uh, but this will give you an idea of the kinds of, of money we're talking about. Um, the stock media business at present has a market size, or I should say in the next three years, I should say has a market size of approximately $7 billion uh, in total. That means the, the 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 total amount of money that the likes of Getty, iStock, Shutterstock, Pond5, so on and so forth, Alamy, uh, hope to make in licensing fees will probably reach about $7 billion. Uh, the data set market, interestingly enough, is probably going to be it's probably valued at this very moment around four point eight billion dollars. What will possibly and is considered to or is expected to uh, increase. Uh, and so this number, while it is it is certainly state of the art at this very moment, will probably be outdated in another couple of months. Um, I think we broke that down by saying um, uh, with visual data sets, I'm sorry, and I want to add that on here by visual data sets out of the total amount here being worth about $1.3 billion. Uh, I, I think I broke this down by saying that 30% would be text and, and speech content, 28% images and video, and 42% audio and others. So if any of you who collect audio snippets and or sound effects and or have voice uh, a, a voice uh, a library, uh, that content is extremely valuable and will absolutely be uh, in, uh, 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 in demand. Uh, and as I, as I said to you, uh, we're, we, we, we reached out to a, a variety of, of, of content libraries and to individuals. Um, we have been shooting our own biometric, uh, propriety biometric content in studio now for about two and a half years. Uh, and I think, uh, as you might have seen on the last slide, I think we've acquired or accumulated 525,000 images thus, thus far. Uh, and it makes, I think it now, I think it now stands as the world's largest biometric model, uh, a data set of models. Uh, we have acquired content from stock media suppliers. We're beginning to crowdsource. So that means that anybody who's in on this on this webinar who's interested in potentially uh, uh, supplying their content, we'd be interested in speaking with you. Uh, likewise, with any individual contributors, we'd be interested in speaking with you as well, as well as with, for any non-media partners, we'd be interested in speaking with you as well. Uh, there is a lot, a lot to, uh, uh, to sort of take in here and a lot of opportunities not to be missed. Uh, as I indicated in, the, in, in two slides ago about the biometric content, each one of the slot, each one of the images is 42 megapixels. Uh, uh, that equals a size of 7952 times 5304. Uh, we shoot on a, a Sony uh, A7. I'm sorry, a, a Sony uh, camera, uh, uh, and uh, we're also shooting video on the same on the same uh, cameras. Uh, however, we're taking content and on a variety of, of, of media platforms, and so that's really not that important. Uh, we're, as I said, uh, capturing between seven and 12 emotional expressions uh, in a 360 degree environment, pitch and yaw, full body posture and motion and video. Uh, we uh, work again within full compliance of GDPR, uh, BIPA, uh, CPP, CPPR, uh, CCPR, I should say, and BII. Uh, that means that we expect that all of our we expect all of our uh, content contributors to uh, deploy a biometric model release. Uh, you're thinking to yourself, where do I get a biometric model release? You can download that from Getty Images; uh, they're available, or you can download it also from the from the data set shop. Uh, those biometric model releases allow you to capture biometrics of the model that you'll be shooting, and then to license that content both in North America as well as in Europe, where GDPR uh, is in effect. Uh, uh, and as well as uh, elsewhere in the world where GDPR uh, is is uh, uh, taken as the law of the land. Um, we uh, work with uh, lots of raw data 
uh, every single day. I think every single day we're taking in thousands of images and we're 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 identifying uh, that content and beginning to process it. And the processing works in in the very beginning in a very hands-on sort of way, uh, which involves uh, weeding out all of the content that may not fit the parameters, the technical parameters, the legal parameters, as well as any aesthetic parameters that we have. Uh, we are heavily involved in modifying the metadata uh, because despite the fact that this is very, uh, art, that, that artificial intelligence seems very, very high tech, the fact of the matter is that uh, this is all driven, all success within generative AI is driven by high quality metadata. The better the quality of the metadata, the more accurate the metadata, the more granular the metadata, metadata the higher degree of discoverability that the metadata uh, uh, infers onto the asset, the better the quality of the asset itself and the more valuable those assets are uh, to the to any algorithm in, in training on that content. And so uh, uh, when you when you think about shooting for generative uh, AI creating data sets, uh, you should be absolutely focusing on improving the metadata. Uh, what we what we have found is that the metadata that previously worked very, very well for stock imagery works to some degree with um, generative AI. Although we have also found out that there's a whole lot of uh, metadata types and, 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 and approaches that just were not ever thought about. And so that's perhaps something for a second uh, a webinar at another time talking about uh, applying metadata for generative AI, but enough to say that uh, 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 the types of metadata that, 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 that have previously been very successful in discovering content in a static library perhaps may not work so well uh, in uh, a, a dynamic uh, environment uh, like generative AI. And as I said, I'll go into that a little bit later on. I'm certainly happy to answer that in any questions uh, that might come up at the end of the, uh, the, end of the, the webinar. Um, uh, Lastly, I thought, or, or, or near last, I thought that I would talk about uh, uh, the visual media IP space. Uh, I, I think I hinted uh, quite a number of times in this in the webinar, what kind of clients are attracted to us, what kind of clients seem to be gobbling up the, the majority of generative con or data set content at this very moment. And as I said, it's, it's lots of medical companies, lots of ID and facial recognition companies, lots of environmental detection companies, lots of emotional uh, emotion and customer engagement uh, companies, companies that are engaged in all of all this. And then lastly, lots of companies that are engaged in analytics. Um, we are, as I said, never not surprised. Uh, there is not a day that doesn't go by where we don't sit there with our jaws literally on the table wondering where did this company come from? How do they find us? A What in God's name, what kind of products are they developing? Very rarely do we have full insights into the products that they're developing. We just get hints through the types of content that they're interested in, 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 in licensing from us. Um, and then lastly, uh, this is just a slide that talks about what I call about the, 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 the uh, direct market size by 2027. And um, I, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen at this moment and see about answering some of the questions that uh, uh, I had thought that would be coming up here in the in, in, in this webinar. And you know, I wanted to talk about where did platforms, first of all, I want to talk about other platforms. Where did platforms like DALI, Midjourney, and Stability get their training data? Um, I think there's probably a lot of questions about you know, open AI and, and, and their competitors and where in God's name do they get all these mm -hmm. billions upon billions of pieces of content in order to train uh, their algorithm. Um, and as I said in the beginning, the truth of the matter is that, in the, that, that a lot of the, um, the content that was sourced in the very beginning came through slate of hand, uh, not ethically, uh, not through ethical means. And there's still going to be a lot of what I call uh, contested, uh, 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 a lot of contested, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, acquisition here in courts, uh, as well as uh, uh, in the public sphere. Uh, we know that OpenAI originally uh, uh, got much of their data from a data set and, and Gen Midjourney and Stability from a data set called the Lion data set. That's L-A-I-O-N. Uh, the Lion data set uh, is a data set that was based upon scraped data. 
Uh, it's approximately 5 billion pieces of content, visual content, uh, that was scraped from the likes of every single person that's probably listening to this webinar uh, and an entire uh, nation of people beyond that. Uh, it's almost staggering the volume of theft that went on. And so companies like Midjourney and Stability uh, built their uh, publicly successful, although uh, what I call legally qu legally questionable products upon on, on, upon uh, stolen content. Uh, Dali, uh, that's OpenAI, uh, has has shifted to a legal. Uh, training uh, regime. I think now they get about 70% of all of their content through Shutterstock uh, and another 30% through something called uh, uh, Creative Commons, which is a CC0 license, meaning that they that they that they go through a variety of sources to acquire content that has gone uh, uh, into the public space, content from the Library of Congress, content from NASA, content from from a variety of government sources as well as orphaned works, meaning uh, this is content that, uh, that 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 no content creative has has, has applied for uh, content uh, has applied for a copyright on and now resides in the public space without any uh, ownership. Uh, and that, unfortunately, while they have made it has created fantastic products, I have to say that both Dali or all three of them, Dali, Midjourney, and Stability, uh, output some amazing uh, visuals. Uh, the unfortunately uh, the, the the bad taste in the, that has that it has left in, in many people's mouths uh, is not something that's going to go away easily, and it has also acted as a what I call it a radioactive repellent uh, to many uh, uh, big corporations who sort of are skittish about uh, using any one of the aforementioned products uh, as uh, to generate any content uh, because any of the resulting content uh, has uh, uh, copyright issues. Uh, the fact is that uh, the, the the content that was used to train that uh, those algorithms is is legally questionable. Therefore, the outputs are legally questionable. There's absolutely zero way of 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 uh, divesting the output from the input. So, if the if the data set that is used to train the algorithm is legally toxic, radioactive, it means that the outputs will be equally radioactive and legally toxic. And I can't imagine uh, big name companies wanting to uh, take any of that content and, and, and associate it with their brands, uh, fearing public blowback and or having a, uh, a army of lawyers uh, grind them into subatomic particles. And so uh, hopefully that answers that question. Uh, I'll, I'll jump on to the next question, which I think, again, uh, uh, I think is, 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 is perhaps topic number two here, which is can I leverage or exploit my already existing archive uh, to generate revenue. So in other words, if you are a, a photographer, you're a videographer, and you have a large archive of content, and you're thinking, hey, how can I get in on this? The answer is yes. Uh, that content is invaluable. And it's not just the content that you chose for iStock or Getty or Shutterstock or so on and so forth. It's not the prime content that's interesting. It's also the stuff that fell on the cutting room floor uh, because generative AI, generative algorithms need to learn from mistakes. So it doesn't have to be the perfectly focused, the perfectly composed image where the model is looking at the, the camera, smiling, the lighting was great. In fact, it could be the crappiest image. It could be the one where the hand is literally uh, in the frame. It could be the one where somebody's out of focus. It could be the one where the backdrop slipped. It can be anything. Uh, there is nothing that's out of bounds for uh, data for, uh, that has that, that there's nothing for that is out of bounds. All content has a value. And so data sets are not just made up of prime images, beautifully composed images. It's made up of, of images in general. Uh, or content in general. And so, yes, you can exploit your content, you can leverage your content, you can make money from it. Um, all sorts of subjects. I've made a comment twice already about everything from asphalt to zebras, and it's true. It's quite literally everything, everything from soda cans uh, to to microphones to, 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 to fire hydrants, trees, leaves, grass, uh, the world is literally an opportunity that can't, that should not be, I should say, should not be not captured somehow, should not be not photographed, should not not be uh, videoed. Um, 
Again, if you're going to shoot real models, uh, I would absolutely urge you to, to download the Getty, the most up-to-date Getty model release, which allows you uh, to uh, uh, guarantee that it is biometric uh, and that you can uh, absolutely use that uh, release to then uh, 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 ensure that that content could be licensed in Europe and that, that the model is well-informed uh, about his or her rights, uh, what exactly is generative AI, how will the content be used, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, I thought I would also talk about uh, what vendors uh, could be trusted in, or where can you sell your stuff besides us? Uh, what opportunities are out there? I wanted to mention that uh, Shutterstock has a, uh, a very interesting program right now. I'm not fully aware of how much their, their content creatives are being offered right now. The, the revenue split is not exactly 100% clear. Uh, however, uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, they are working uh, very, very hard to uh, ensure that uh, they are ticking all the boxes, crossing all the T's and uh, dotting all the I's and to, to create a, a safe, uh, legally safe, I should say, and legally, uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, firm space for, for both the content creatives as well as their clients to uh, Come in and 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 license uh, generative content as well as license uh, uh, data uh, from them for uh, 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 what do you call it, the training of generative AI. Uh, I I know that all the things I've just said is probably not going to have much of an effect on many of the people who are uh, listening to this or watching this this webinar who believe that uh, this is the death of stock photography, that, that generative AI is the devil incarnate, and that uh, no good will ever come out of all of this. Uh, I understand all that. And as a content creator by myself, I, I too had serious doubts in the very, very beginning. Uh, but as I said quite a few times, that uh, the, the types of clients that have come to us and the types of clients who I see are interested in um, uh, training data uh, are, are definitely not in a position to replace you as photographers, you as content creatives, but are only building products based upon your content, building products which are not necessarily competitive with you, uh, but are certainly going to be part of your lives, whether you go to a bank and you attempt to use your face to, to access your bank account, or you go to a building and you use your thumbprint, your handprint. I saw recently that the state of New York um, and a number of other states are going to soon have uh, uh, or going to soon allow liquor stores the ability to determine uh, 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 consumers' age based upon palm prints. And so quite a number of companies have jumped on that and they're developing um, uh, 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 what do you call it? point of purchase uh, uh, mechanisms, which will allow people to put their palm print onto a device. Uh, and uh, that will determine how old they are. And so immediately afterwards, we began sourcing palm images, as many as we possibly could. In fact, we, we immediately put together a data set, I think a, a couple of tens of thousands of images of people's palms. Uh, we get requests for some of the most arcane subject matter, um, lots of agricultural uh, companies, lots of companies who are involved in food processing or companies that are involved in uh, uh, dealing with agriculture or improving agricultural yields. Uh, so they're interested in pictures of, of wheat, corn, uh, uh, of tomatoes, every kind of fruit, vegetable that you can honestly think of uh, has, has, has come across our desks, I meaning requests for all that kinds of content. Uh, so it's not just people, it's everything. Uh, the construction industry is incredibly uh, data hungry. And so I mentioned asphalt before, and I know that's gotten quite a lot of laughs from people that I've spoken with, uh, but it's the truth. Uh, asphalt is incredibly important. Um, companies which look for, or I should say construction companies, companies that are involved in, in, in urban planning are constantly on the lookout for uh, data sets which involve uh, a variety of, of asphalt types, uh, of asphalts in, in a variety of situations or in a variety of conditions, uh, likewise with glass, windows, doors. Um, it could be anything. So for shooters who are always on the lookout for opportunities, um, I couldn't think of, of, a, of a greater open door, an open opportunity to make money uh, than uh, just that. Uh, imagine being paid to shoot doors, windows, uh, coffee cups, uh, 
computer mice and so on and so forth. Uh, the world is open uh, if you wish to engage. If you don't wish to engage and you feel that generative AI and this entire new this new arrival of of, of uh, artificial intelligence is a threat. Uh, I, I, I understand that, and I'm here also to tell you that I don't believe, I truly don't believe, uh, that generative AI will be taking away anybody's jobs. I think that quality shooters, people who shoot quality content, will always be in demand. And I, and I think that, that organically produced photography will always have a value, and in fact, perhaps even a greater value, given that there will now be a comparison by many, many consumers of, well, this is what generative put out, but you know what? Uh, content that comes from, from real photographers you know, just has something to it. It, 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 it has a, an authenticity to it. And so I would tell you not to throw away your cameras uh, immediately, and I would tell you to go out and continue to purchase really, really great, uh, 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 really, really great equipment to improve your game uh, because the higher the quality of the equipment, the better the quality of the lens, the better the quality of the media, uh, uh, and the, the bigger the capture, uh, 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 the bigger the capture, uh, the better the quality of the data itself at the very, very end. And so if you think that 42 megapixels isn't enough and a 48 megapixel camera comes out tomorrow, you might give it some thought uh, because it, it'll absolutely be in demand. Um, I think uh, what I'll do now is I will I will ask Derek if it's possible to open the floor up for questions and answers. That'll give us an opportunity to to get as much in right now. I don't want to sort of uh, reduce this down to ten minutes and then give every, give nobody a chance. Uh, I think if we have let's say twenty minutes of, of Q and A, I think that'll be more than enough. Uh, Derek, yeah, definitely. We'll open it up for some Q and A. I want to get the conversation started, Mark, with the legal aspect. I think this is Jeez. probably one of the most important and interesting aspects of the AI debate is, I guess I'll, I'll analogize it this way. I'm a photographer. I grow up looking and being inspired by other photographers' works. Those works play into the style that I actually develop for myself versus I'm a photographer. I look at a certain photographer's work and I mimic it and I copy it and I produce my own version of it. That all, taking that situation into account, from a legal perspective, what does it look like and, and what's on the horizon of? We, we haven't, to my knowledge, I haven't seen any huge cases where it's been a, a precedent has been set, probably because AI has evolved so quickly and it's become so popular basically overnight. Usually you have time for things to get fleshed out and then for a precedent to be set. It's so not not messy but it's so vast it's like an it's like the ocean it's like trying to to you know catalog every inch of the ocean that's what we're looking at in terms of ai how do we set legal precedents where do where do we begin where are we at as far as proving you know i i do a job for a client i hand them an ai project or product someone files a lawsuit based on training data but i say well I didn't, you know, if if the AI software used everything out there to to train their their AI, that doesn't affect me. I didn't personally, you know, you can't point, you know, where where's the DNA of what is being used? How easy or difficult is it to prove what is being used to train these AI modules? Do you, do you see where I'm going? It's it's kind of sure. hard to put. It's so it's so new and it's so fresh and so vast that it's hard to really put a question. But where are we at on on the legal end of things? Sure. Well, a number of suits have been filed in the last months, uh, including Getty Images, uh, uh, who have filed uh, a suit on behalf of all of their contributors uh, against uh, Stability as well as OpenAI, uh, and I think potentially uh, I'm sorry, and Midjourney, uh, uh, because they believe and they they believe based upon their research that a large sum of the training data that was used to create those very successful consumer facing algorithms uh, was based upon Getty content and Getty content that was not uh, licensed, but instead was scraped, as I indicated in the very beginning. Uh, those cases have not come to adjudication yet. And so we are sort of in limbo at this very, very moment legally. Uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, it is not looking good for the likes of Disability or Midjourney or even OpenAI, the first iteration of, of DALI. Uh, as I also indicated, and I want to be very clear here, they've now moved, uh, OpenAI has now moved to a fully licensed 
uh, environment where they have absolutely made clear that their content is licensed from 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 Shutterstock, about seventy percent of it, and the other thirty percent have been coming from uh, uh, open sources. And so uh, they are they are absolutely uh, what I call in the clear. But that doesn't take away from the fact that there is a potential, and nobody quite knows, and the courts have not come down on anybody yet. So in other words, if I say something here, there's no authority behind my my comments, no legal authority. But what 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 that does do it creates doubt and it has made this environment or it has made companies skittish, gun shy. So you're not going to see the likes of a Coca-Cola. You're not going to see the likes of a, uh, of a, of a Logitech or a, or a Lenovo or, or a General Motors using the likes of Stability or Midjourney or Dolly to create ad copy, to create anything visual because they are expressly worried that it will come back to bite them. Uh, that does not prevent, that does not, or has not prevented, uh, uh, or that has not, or I should say, impacted the aforementioned agent, or the aforementioned uses that I talked about. In other words, the companies that have come to the data set shop to come to visual, because it's a completely different uh, uh, sector, a completely different silo here. But when it comes to, you know, generating synthetic media, synthetic photography, uh, uh, this space is rife with legal issues which have yet to be ironed out. It is a mess. However, uh, what can photographers do? What can content creatives do? They can, first of all, educate themselves. They can go onto Google. They can look for the LION data set, L-A-I-O-N. And there is a website and they can go on and take a look at it. They can download it themselves. Why not? Uh, it's it's available to anybody. They can download it themselves. It's quite a large file. You might need uh, a larger hard drive, but I think everybody's got that. Uh, and they can be going through it. They can begin going through it themselves. However, and if they don't want to do that, they can go to a website called Have I Been Trained? Have I Been Trained? dot com, and Have I Been Trained? Uh, is a space where uh, you can go and you can upload any image that you believe might have been misused, stolen, scraped, and or an image of yourself and or you can type in your name and uh, you will see whether or not that content resides within the, the, the Lion data set. Uh, and if you should come up with a hit, as I even have, I found my own images there. I found pictures of myself. Uh, you can file if you are a European citizen, you can file uh, in Europe under GDPR and uh, and and ask for relief. Uh, that might work or might not work. Uh, if you are not a European citizen and you're here in North America, uh, you could file locally through a uh, through any sort of a number of of of, of opportunity with well, an attorney that might uh, uh, help you understand better. Uh, what your your opportunities are for relief here in the state of New York, or even you know in, in New Jersey, Connecticut, so on and so forth. Okay. Now we have a question, and and Renee, if you're still watching, and I, I have taken the question wrong, please please clarify. But Renee says, so how do we get involved in providing this data? What's the submission process or platform? Right. So as I said, there are not very many places to sell your data at this very moment. It's interesting. There are there are many opportunities for people to steal your data, but there are very few places for you to counter that and actually take control of your data and then license it. Uh, as I mentioned, there is the data set shop. That's us. Uh, however, there's also Shutterstock. And Shutterstock has, has, has through their, their FAQ, uh, done a pretty decent job. Uh, Michael uh, 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 Michael uh, uh, Ficello, who's the who's the director of that project, uh, has been made has made a very very good uh, effort uh, to to get as much education uh, uh, or to be as educated, I should say, as possible with their content creatives. Uh, and to 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 make everybody aware of how the process is, but there are really not too many places at this very moment. You could do it yourself. Uh, if you have a website, you could set up a data set shop on your own. There's nothing wrong with banding together data. In other words, all that is is just the aggregation of subject matter. You know, you have images of, of luggage, you have images of asphalt. I continuously go back to that. You could have you have images of trees, bushes, doors. Uh, you could aggregate it by subject matter and and place it there for for sale. Uh, you know, you can use the data set shop's pricing mechanism as sort of a, as sort of a barometer. Uh, as a gauge for yourself, and you'll see what what the what the market bears in terms of pricing at this very very moment for that content. 
Uh, some of you might actually, you know, become data set millionaires as sort of occurred very quickly in the very beginning of Microstock time. All of a sudden, Microstock showed up back in the early 2000, 2003, 2004. And within a very short amount of time, you had people like Yuri Akars, Andres Rodriguez, and others who became millionaires from selling Microstock. In other words, this was content that was being sold not for hundreds of dollars per license or thousands of dollars per license, but for, in some cases, you know, less than a dollar per license or even a few dollars per license. And by volume, they were able to create themselves a empire. Uh, likewise, with data, with data, data is a volume game. And so uh, it's not going to be, oh, well, I sold it. I sold a single image of a of a of a, of a, uh, a roller bag, you know, a, 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 what do you call it? a piece of luggage, uh, you know, for one hundred thousand dollars. It's not going to happen. That piece of luggage might sell for a couple of pennies. Uh, but data sets are not one image. They're not a thousand images. They're in the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of images. And so, uh, you know, images which have been augmented, in other words, you shoot a piece of luggage, shoot it from every angle, you know, flip it, reverse it. Because as I said at one point in the conversation, uh, the algorithm is, is interested in every viewpoint. It's not the most perfect images that count. It's every image that counts. I think that was one of the things that stuck out from our last conversation, because we did talk about that. And I remember you telling me, Mark, that it's actually the the imperfect images yes. that are more important to AI, where it's like, okay, it's the the in-betweens, the blurry or the, the off-looking, because what do we look at when we look at just stock stock in general, whether you're talking photo, video, anything, we're looking at person smiling, person frowning. We're not looking at like the in-between or the person being confused. And I think I'm gonna I'm gonna throw something out. You tell me if I'm completely wrong, but my my little pea brain says. The more we have of the in-betweens, you know, it's like it's like the brain. What does the brain do when you have a memory here and a memory here? Your brain fills in the gap. If you don't have that information between your 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 brain fills it in. If with AI, if we just have person frowning, person smiling, we don't have the face that we all make when you get caught off guard and you're you're in between a smile and a frown. That's when it leads to imperfections in the final product or in you know the the ai i think we all love to throw out the the six finger finger yeah, six <laughs> figure finger hands in ai something does that help in building a stronger and more complete data set yes the answer is yes it's an unequivocal yes because look you, reality is not perfect people close mm -hmm. their eyes they look in one way they look in the other uh, you know, they they talk with just they, they talk with their hands. Many people do, like myself. Uh, and so, because of that, uh, AI has to be able to recognize that. As I said, if you're doing if you're doing security work, identification work, you're looking to see what a person looks like. Not everybody's just going to stand there like a robot or a perfect stock image and smile, looking directly at the camera. Some people are going to be confused. Some people will be focused on something else, a dog, a cat, a child, a siren going off in the background. You know, they're not focused on the task at hand. And so when they're being asked to look at the camera, look at this thing, please tell us if this is really you. Uh, or again, a, a car. Cars are not always stopped. They're in motion. Bicycles are not just standing there. They're going someplace. Birds and dogs, cats don't just sit still they move and so uh whenever if you're going to think about shooting for for data sets throw everything in everything even the kitchen sink should be thrown in because the more the better hmm. all right now i'm going to throw out a question I'm, I'm taking creative license here because i think it is such an interesting topic and what makes it interesting is all the possibilities depending on where you get your data from i've heard Scientists say there's up to six doppelgangers that everyone has up to six doppelgangers in the world. I've heard with 8 billion people, there's a chance that 80,000 people out there look like you. Is it? I'm having fun with it, Mark. You got to excuse me. How many, I mean, you're pulling random data. Yep. Is, is there, is there a, a very good chance you would say based on what you've seen so far that I'm going to have an AI twin somewhere out there that it's going to be something that is virtually indistinguishable for other than obviously I, I have tattoos that would differentiate, but what are the odds of having AI doppelgangers out there? And I'm mm -hmm. looking at it from an interest, interest perspective. 
And then, uh, you know, there's going to be someone out there that should that be the case. It's, you know, someone just happens to run into one of their AI doppelgangers and files a lawsuit because that's what we do now. Right. So the answer to that question is that it depends on the content curation, on the curation. So all generative products should have real humans involved. There should not just be an automated process where content goes in, the algorithm chews on it and spits out automated uh, synthetic data without real humans sitting there, just like in a real uh, content workflow. Uh, you know, nobody just, there, I can't imagine a content workflow where a photographer's in a studio shooting things, the, 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 the tethered, the camera is tethered to a, uh, to a hard drive. There's not a data wrangler there, that there's not anybody actually looking at the content, that there's not somebody taking, you know, the, 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 the pictures that should not be in there out. Uh, there must be an editor. So uh, anybody who thinks that generative AI is gonna get rid of, of, of photo editors is absolutely wrong because a real human absolutely must be involved. They must be able to see uh, that. And so your, your question has an answer, although it is not a perfect answer. So there is content curation that goes into effect. There is a, there is a, there is a process by which when a generative uh, algorithm uh, uh, dumps a volume of synthetic content into a folder, that that synthetic content is not then fed back against the original training data to determine whether or not there are any similars. And so if there are any similars, they're thrown away. And so good quality editing, good quality curation will reduce that. So the answer to your question is, will there be a double ganger? Possible. If there is good quality curation, good quality editing uh, throughout the process, that will be reduced. Uh, and perhaps eliminated entirely. So will you see somebody that looks like you? Possibly, but it won't be you, hopefully. Okay. That's a good answer. Look, that's way better than I think I would have been able to give. And, and I think that your knowledge and expertise and experience on this topic obviously lends to that. A lot of us are just living out here. It's like we watch sci-fi movies and TV shows, and it's very easy to get dragged into the the extreme end of the scale, which I, I I thank you for providing some some grounding, and and you know we talked about it in the green room. There's always going to be the gloom and doom types, no matter what technology comes along. There's going to be people who have the gloom and doom outlook, and I think there is, as we discussed, there's been a ton of AI already interconnected into our everyday lives that we don't realize, and there are. This isn't going to robots are not going to be running the world in five years because of AI. There's always going to be a human element. I think you look at anything. Anything you look at anything in the world, you can take a single the rule of law, which is, you know, a lot of people say, OK, the rule of law. Well, the rule of law is subject to one person's definition of it or who is the law going before? You know, when we sit before a judge, it's not necessarily the rule of law. It's that judge's interpretation of the rule of law. And I think that plays over into the AI world where how do you take what this this module says or does and how do you use it? It's going to be there's so much ambiguity attached to it that. It makes it interesting. It makes it fun. I think I've seen some AI images that are amazing. And instead of focusing on the beauty of it and how easy it makes it to create, you know, I look at with photography, cell phone cameras have been huge for photography. They haven't run photography out of business. It hasn't, right. you know, it hasn't run cameras out of it. No, it's made more people get involved in it. And then what happens? There's a natural progression from, okay, I started taking pictures on my cell phone on my way to work. And now, I have opened up a business as a portrait photographer or family photographer. So I think AI speaks to that same vein of now I can't paint. I've always wanted to be able to paint or I've always had trouble creating something on a blank canvas. Now people like me who are good with their words can start diving into AI prompts and you can use it for a creative thing where I can now create things with my words that I couldn't do before with my hands or with my mind. And that doesn't even dive into the whole career aspect of it, where I've, I've heard of prompt writers. Prompt writing is now a career, right. and it's pretty lucrative. I like to call I like to call it synthography. And I like to call those people, instead of prompt engineers or prompt writers, which has a very, I don't know, comes out of my mouth, sort of like a shopping cart tumbling out, out of my, <laughs> out of my tongue. I, I like to call them synthographers, and I like to call it synthography. Uh, uh, it just uh, just uh, it just rolls off the tongue much easier and sounds much nicer. 
Uh, you know, uh, I'll, I'll double down on what you just said by 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 telling uh, the listeners here and the, the viewers, I should say, that many of you might consider mining your own data, mining your own uh, uh, your own library. Hey, why can't I create my own uh, synthetic outputs from my own content? And the answer is, of course, yes, you can. Uh, there are there are ample opportunity and a much greater opportunity nowadays than there was even a year ago uh, to to set up an algorithm on your own, to take your content, the, the content that you've had sitting on hard drives now for years, you've accumulated of a variety of subjects. And again, it doesn't have to be the most perfect stuff. It can be the outputs, the outtakes, I should say, as well. Uh, and creating your own synthetic content uh, and taking control of it yourself and licensing it yourself. Uh, because you asked earlier whether or not there were opportunities. I mentioned uh, uh, Shutterstock. I mentioned Michael Franchello. And his efforts at Shutterstock uh, to 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 ensure uh, that uh, uh, that that the legalities were all being followed and that content creatives were being respected and and, and uh, uh, remunerated. Uh, there is also Adobe, uh, Adobe to a lesser extent, and so there's opportunities also there uh, for for content creatives to create their own synthetic media and then to license them synthetic media through the likes of Adobe. Uh, they have made it. They've made a. They've made a channel uh, for people to to contribute synthetic outputs, uh, and to then hopefully uh, be remunerated for any downloads that come. In the same way that they're they're, they're given royalty right now or paid royalties uh, for for organic photography or video or any other kind of creative efforts. Uh, and so uh, you know, uh, take control of your take a, take control of your own content. Uh, you know, uh, there's never been a better time. It's never been easier. Um, and, I, and, I, and I think that, uh, you know, the, all the doom and gloom talk, well, yes, to some degree, and I'll repeat it many, many times uh, in any conversation, uh, but it's not that bad. Uh, it's up to you again. It's up to everybody. Don't sell your cameras. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, I already got them all. They're already on eBay. Yeah. Mark, <laughs> this, didn't dis this did not disappoint. This was everything I, I thought it was going to be and wanted it to be. It's a super, super, super interesting conversation. I look forward to seeing how things progress. Uh, I was going to say over over the next couple of years, but at this point, it might be over the next couple of months, the way things are moving. So we're definitely going to keep you on the radar. I'm going to keep tabs and and keep checking in with you and keep the conversation going. We'd love to have you back in the future and see thank you. where we're at six months, a year, two years yep. from now. Who sure. knows? But uh, a huge thank you to you. You guys go check out Visual and... Uh, we drop the the uh, let's drop the website there, Marcus. It's just visual .com. Well, they can go to yes, they can also go to the data set, the data set shop. So datasetshop.com. In Perfect. fact, what I'll do is I will uh, let's see here. I'll type a message here. Let's see. Uh, there we go. Data set shop .com. And, and we'll throw that into the comments section for everybody. Thank you. Um, Perfect. I'm going to drop that there for my team so that they can drop that into the comments section. Uh, www.datasetshop.com, D-A-T-A-S-E-T-S-H-O-P.com. And uh, we'll look to hear more from Mark in the future and, and keep up on this whole rapidly changing world Oops, of AI. Com. And there yeah. we go. There I, wrote we go. Dot, I wrote dot .com, so there you are. There that we means go. That, that, that demands now a second chapter. First of all, I got to get us. I have to learn how to spell better, and I have to. <laughs> and I have to also wait for the next chapter to sort of uh, uh, tell everybody how successful things have be, become. And looking forward to hearing from you again, Mark. I'm looking forward to keeping the conversation going. To all of you out there, thank you for your input, your questions, and of course your viewership. As always, again, check out this and all of our other live content on YouTube at b &H Event Space right there on YouTube. A huge thank you to Mark and the Visual team for making this happen. To all of our viewers out there, thank you as always. Can't do it without you. We do it for you. That's it. Another round of the b &H Virtual Event Space in the books. Catch y'all next time. Bye-bye, Derek.